Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Cycling Research Reviews. So we're up to 85 subscribers as I uh, record this, which is pretty good. So I guess let's keep going. This week, uh, this paper is by Anne Forsyth and Kevin Kreisick, titled Urban Design, Is There a Distinctive View from the Bicycle? They ask, would urban design considerations and practices be different if the experience of bicycling was provided a more central role in dialogues regarding the future of our cities? And to answer this question, the paper juxtaposes what I would call the quantitative engineering approach. So this includes uh, most of urban planning, uh, traffic engineers, and uh, the more of the engineering mathematical discipline, and that includes modeling as well. And they contrast that approach to the more qualitative, user-centered approach uh, of urban designers, such as Jan Gale, uh, such as uh, White in the 1960s, and such as Kevin Lynch, who talked about uh, spatial awareness and the image of the city. So they write, cyclists have needs from the standpoint of urban design that differ substantially from pedestrians, motors, or transit users. Furthermore, it is contended that full provision for their needs is unlikely to come to fruition until their perspective is more formally acknowledged in research and through urban design guidelines. Therefore, this paper aims to respond to three questions. What would it mean to create an urban design approach based on the bicycle in addition to, or instead of, the motorized vehicle and the pedestrian? What are the dimensions of Peter Appleyard's view from the road from the perspective of the cyclist? So how can we translate uh, perhaps the work that has been done on highways and moving scenery into the language of cycling? And what are the implications of the processes of city building, particularly of applying cycling uh, design to sustainable urban design and urban development? So these are the three questions posed by Forsyth and Kreisick. Right. And then they now seek to try and understand uh, the cyclist perspective by putting two different frameworks. Uh, number one is quite clearly the, the traffic approach versus the urban design approach. Uh, and they encapsulate these two approaches by looking at uh, what sorts of characteristics are similar to motorized vehicles. For cyclists and what kind of cyclist characteristics are more similar to uh, pedestrians. So on the one hand, uh, more like a motor vehicle is that cyclists have wheels and they roll, so they kind of require smooth asphalt. Um, you have directionality and momentum. Um, and also you, on, on a bicycle, you are moving quite a bit faster than uh, a pedestrian. So when you navigate through the city, uh, you need uh, things like turning radiuses, you need uh, larger signs for wayfinding, etc., etc. Now, on the side of pedestrians, uh, it, cyclists are, for example, exposed to the environment. Uh, cyclists uh, can easily dismount their bike and transform into a pedestrian uh, when uh, on a busy street, for example. And also uh, cyclists have limited range and are human powered like a pedestrian. Um, and this gives us more human characteristics to consider, such as, for example, if you're going up a hill, right, you're, you're dealing with human muscle power. Uh, so you should design for that instead of uh, for an unlimited power de delivered by an electric or gasoline motor. Uh, you also have uh, safety concerns, right? So uh, on the issue of safety concerns, you have motor vehicles in which you're in a cage. Uh, and uh, on the side of pedestrians, you are completely exposed and unprotected by any sort of armor. Uh, for the cyclist, this is perhaps even a more vulnerable point where you're unprotected, you're going faster, and you're balancing on two wheels. So these are kind of the issues that are at play in terms of safety. Now let's go on to look at issues of movement and uh, parking and how 
uh, different aspects of the urban environment can influence cycling and how they compare to pedestrians and motor vehicles. I think another huge advantage of cycling is that uh, the parking requirements are, are very limited. Yes, you can get your bicycle stolen, but the physical space and be able to place your bicycle next to uh, your destination is a, is a huge advantage that puts cycling uh, much closer to the, the realm of pedestrians in terms of freedom of movement to get close to where you need to be before you have to walk. In terms of carrying loads, cyclists can carry quite a bit more than uh, pedestrians given the right equipment. Uh, but without the right equipment, then uh, cycling is more like the load capacity of pedestrians. If you have equipment such as cargo bikes or even these electrified cargo delivery uh, tricycles, then you can carry much more, more like a, a car or a small truck. It is also worth mentioning that, uh, like a pedestrian, uh, I think in most pla in all places, uh, you don't need a uh, license to ride a bicycle, so that that gives uh, freedom of movement to people of all ages. In theory, although uh, as we know, that requires good design of infrastructure uh, to make that safe and practical for everyone as well. Next, we look at the six dimensions of urban design and how these relate to cycling in terms of overall layout, facilities, uh, processes, and also the detailed design elements. So there's six, and the first one, and the one that they argue that is paid most attention to it when designing for cycling is function. Uh, and that seems to be heavily focused on. And we'll go through the other five, which are much less focused on. So the other five are morphology, uh, perception, social issues, the aesthetic and visual uh, pleasantries of the environment and also time time both in objective time and also uh, how time is perceived on the move right so in terms of morphology uh, this kind of goes into the work of, of kevin lynch and and how uh, both how cities are perceived in terms of wayfinding and space but also morphology in more concrete terms, such as um, how far is it to the grocery store? How far is it to work? Uh, as we said, bicycles have a limited range, so you know the morphology of a city has to kind of cater and match to that range in order for cycling to be practical. Right, number two, uh, perception. Right. So uh, now this again is about hierarchy and wayfinding. So how does the whole city make sense? Uh, does the whole city intellectually mentally can you map out where you need to go and if you can't if you're going to a new destination uh, is it clear uh, and also on the micro scale is it clear how streets are set up do cyclists have their own space uh, do cyclists uh, perceive the space around them to be safe right the built elements are also perceived clearly from a faster speed so uh, this now perception also in terms of scale and uh, how fast the urban, urban environment moves around the cyclist. Next, we move into social issues, right? The cycling, they argue, and this is kind of much of the work that we've been working on as, as well at the Urban Cycling Institute, is how um, uh, cycling and walking and these more exposed modes of transport, how this leads to more connectivity and social activity between citizens. Right, uh, cycling can be used to connect different destinations, uh, and on the way you can meet all sorts of people. Right, and here this is where Dutch cycling in particular comes in. Uh, in Dutch cycling, it's very normal and embedded in the traffic code to be able to ride side by side. So, uh, and if you see a school of children, sometimes it's uh, uh, three abreast. Right, if you have a five meter bike lane uh, going two ways, you'll see kids riding three, four abreast, and they seem to be having a lot of fun uh, socially as they perform this activity. Right, and uh, for this to happen, right, we have to be able to make it safe for all ages. So uh, the the issue of age and inclusivity also comes back. Next, we move on to the visual and aesthetic elements, which uh, when we think of urban design, or when I think of urban design, that seems to be the most uh, topical element, is the, the visual, right? Uh, it, how buildings fit together to define a space and uh, how we perceive the buildings to come together to uh, make a place, placemaking as they call it, right? Uh, so 
and this is uh, talking about the eye level perspective, right? So when uh, this paper talks about uh, what, what does it mean from a perspective of a cyclist, it means also literally looking at the city from the perspective of a cyclist, right? As you cycle around the city, what do you see? You see you're slightly more elevated than a pedestrian and you're seeing moving scenery that's moving uh, four to five to six times faster than uh, walking scenery. So how does that play into urban design and how does that play into uh, how cyclists perceive the aesthetics uh, of a place? In addition to visual aesthetics, there's, uh, I would say, also important in cycling is sound, uh, feeling, kind of, so, and also the kinesthetics, so how uh, hills and also how uh, the, the pavement and the asphalt rumbles right, as you pass by on, on a bicycle. So it's also very multi-sensory. And that places it apart from the automobile, which uh, bubbles you in and you're able to turn on your own music. So um, that's, that's very interesting to me. And there's papers written about how uh, cyclists mediate the environment by putting in headphones uh, and such. And perhaps now texting <laughs> and, and cycling as well. Uh, so that's also known to be a very controversial issue. But that, that all, all defines the experience uh, of cycling. Right. Uh, finally, we have uh, time. Right. So how do we lay out bike paths um, and how do people perceive uh, subjective time versus objective time? Uh, the, the research I'm doing now is, is trying to compare three routes uh, and with routes with given qualities, if cyclists are all going to the same place, why do people pick different routes? And one of these elements could be a different subjective perception of time, right? Why cyclists pick the longer route? Well, maybe because it feels shorter, because it's nicer, because you have more flow when you uh, don't stop for traffic lights. Um, so laying out uh, the different paths for cycling or laying out the ideal path for cycling doesn't necessarily mean the shortest path from A to B. There are definitely other elements to be considered. And also here, uh, they mention how psychopaths can be uh, also considered for the future, future design. So how do bike, uh, bicycle paths evolve over time as a city and other elements of the transportation network also evolve? I'll take another quote from uh, Forsyth and Krychik. And in my particular interest, they argue that, quote, facilities for cycling have received far more attention than network layout from a urban design and even transportation planning perspective. Right. So if we were to con consider the uh, environment uh, around the cyclist, that in a large part is determined by which routes you pick. Uh, it's it's relatively easier to build cycling infrastructure as in the asphalt and the lighting uh, and perhaps a few benches and your, your crossings with the roads but that that is perhaps relatively easier than actually building let's say a, a new forest surrounding the bike path right so sometimes when you choose a bicycle route then what you're doing is actually also choosing the environment surrounding the bicycle route right so if you pick a route next to a highway while well, you're stuck with uh, a relatively noisy highway environment, regardless of how many plants, uh, trees you plant to kind of try and soften that up. So, uh, so there really the bicycle planning um, considerations come in at two scales. One is on the, I'd say the, the city network scale, right? Where you choose your route. And then the, the second scale is, well, uh, realizing that the impact of choosing a route mean that now you've picked a bike path that goes through a residential area or beside a highway or in some greenery and then that limits what you can do afterwards with the uh, urban design of this route right so then i argue that uh, a, a four meter wide bicycle infrastructure uh, a, a nice wide smooth bike path is uh, perhaps a necessary but insufficient condition for a nice pleasant cycling experience because you're also paying attention to the environment surrounding it. And if you uh, go to the blog uh, or their article, they give a few very good examples of uh, the different environments uh, in their paper. Okay, let's uh, wrap this up then, right? This paper now then concludes with a few practical recommendations for transportation planners and urban planners. 
And uh, they mentioned that even on uh, the issue of safety, for example, where much research has already been done, it, it's still being done from a very functional perspective, right? Using injuries and deaths as, uh, as indicators. We don't want those. But uh, on the other hand, you also have uh, the perception of safety. And ideally, those should kind of line up, right? So they say, quote, uh, safety, not so much in terms of crashes, but in terms of violations from others. So sometimes you get nervous at a crossing, perhaps, remains an untapped issue, right? Uh, drivers passing too closely, you're not injured, but uh, doesn't feel so good. So they say it, this is an untapped issue. Uh, does providing more of a sense of enclosure for cyclists or a cycle I street level wall have negative safety implications? Uh, it remains unclear if additional cycling infrastructure clutters the street environment, creates visual noise, and undermines the experience of other users, right? So we're trying to increase, uh, improve the cycling experience for cyclists, but uh, Forsyth and Kreitzik alerts us to the fact that, well, we should also try to do it in a way that benefits other modes of transport, especially pedestrians. So if I were to summarize uh, Forthick and, and Kreisik's call to action, uh, it's that, uh, quote, given that the cycling lies squarely at the intersection of the domains of transportation planners and urban designers, these planning and design processes have much room to acknowledge both areas of expertise. Now, bringing this to the professional world, I see that, especially uh, when I scroll through the North American uh, job postings for bicycle planners that mostly you're looking for professional engineers people with an engineering background uh, or urban planners who are well versed in how to deal with traffic there is room uh, according to this paper and according to my opinion that uh, there is much room for people who have more of an artistic uh, training and who are more aware of the needs of let's say pedestrians, right? Because without a professional training for bicycle planners, uh, I think the best bet now is to grab people from both ends. One, the people with the quantitative knowledge to actually build out uh, the, the cycling infrastructure network in a, a way that uh, is accordance to the de design manuals, but also number two, this awareness that design ma manuals are not enough that uh, it's not just about the functional criteria, but also the technical knowledge of how to lay down asphalt and how to make direct connections and how to manage traffic. So uh, room for both uh, spectrums of expertise and hopefully we can develop this knowledge, very specialized knowledge of cycling through the interaction of these two domains. All right. Okay, let's get to our final uh, questions and, and let's wrap this up. So uh, as any good academic paper does, uh, this paper uh, leaves us with many more questions than answers, right? Uh, what we gain from this paper, I think, is a nuanced vocabulary on uh, how to articulate why the purely functional approach to bicycle planning fails to provide a good cycling experience. Uh, and they call for future research in a series of six questions, right? Number one, uh, what types of forms are best perceived by cyclists given their height, position, and speed? Number two, how can social interaction between cyclists and others be best considering both the safety and quality of experience? Number three, what level of visual complexity is the most appealing for cyclists in different contexts? Number four, uh, how can social interaction between cyclists and others be best considering the safety and the quality of experience? Number five, what level of visual complexity is the most appealing for cyclists in different contexts? And finally, how can cycling environments evolve over time? All right, that brings us to the conclusion of this paper, and I hope I've done it justice. Um, click on the bell to subscribe below, and also this paper is available open access if you click on in the description below uh, or in the green link on the website. So thank you very much for the support so far. I'll keep going with this and release a video every Tuesday, 
And uh, up next week is uh, Coglin and Rye's uh, paper on the modernization, uh, the marginalization of planning when it comes to the uh, bicycle transportation system. So thank you very much, and I'll see you next week.